So uh, it's my honor to um, get to introduce um, a good friend of mine, um, somebody who's been in the in the CRR world for quite some time now. Yes. <laughs> Um, and he's a glutton for punishment. Every time we invite him to come back down to Montana Fire Chiefs Conference to do a talk, he keeps agreeing to do it. Um, I think it's because he lives close and we buy him beer usually. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's my honor. Um, Division Chief Fire Marshal, but soon to be, we'll call it, we'll go ahead and call it because it's some reorganization and promotion, Deputy Chief. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nope, you're all right. So I, actually, I, I have to tell you, two years ago, I came and did the uh, credentialing class and came and spoke at this conference at a hot springs resort just down the road, one direction or the other. I'm not quite sure which direction. Um, but it was interesting. I actually came a legislative contributor to your guys' association following that because of the sprinkler legislation and some of the things that are going. I feel like it's a big effort to support our neighbors. So. A couple of different things before we end. I'm going to take a selfie with you guys in the background because I like to post that on social media and you guys will figure that as I go along. But an interesting piece, uh, this is just a quote, um, and risk reduction is a battle. The question is, are we winning? Are you winning? And I ask myself that every day and continue to mold myself into that. This is a little bit about the department I joined about six years ago. Um, I put this up on the screen because I like to tell a little bit of a story. When I first got there six years ago, the union, and unfortunately, since this is recorded, I'm hoping they're not going to see it, but the union at that time and most of the leadership in the union or in operations said, hey, it's really nice to have you on board. We know you're this big CRR person. By the way, CRR is the next fad. And we're just waiting for that fad to go away. It's going to be the next new hot topic or hot issue. And it was interesting because listening to Jim this morning and listening to uh, Stephen, when I heard that from the union leadership, I kind of chuckled internally and I had to keep my, my face straight because I thought, man, they really don't have a grasp of what's getting ready to happen or what I'm getting ready to do to them. So this is kind of my process this is one of the reasons why I'm here. I've worked at two different fire departments in regards to community risk reduction, and I've seen what it means for chief officers, company officers, and an organization to embrace CRR. The funniest piece is, is the organization that I was part of before I went to Spokane Valley, they did not embrace CRR. Matter of fact, I had a captain come to me, and he is currently the fire chief there today. When he went to that officer's NFA class, it was a beta test. I got him in that class because I knew he was a very progressive person. I knew he was going to be an up-and-coming leader. I got him in that class. He came back to our organization, came to me immediately after that class and says, Greg, our organization is not ready for this. I've seen the future. And I went, interesting. I at least planted the seed with the right person. Six months after he became fire chief, he had me come over there and teach a class in regards to what community risk reduction is and what it means. Parts and pieces of this is taken from that. Um, the interesting pieces I love to share, that was a combination department. So it was interesting watching you guys answer the questions that Stephen had up on the board in regards to staffing, understanding, training of chief officers, because that's some of what we went through. So right now I'm part of an organization that didn't always embrace CRR and it's a continuous work in progress. I will tell you where we are today is astronomically where we, where, how far we've come from in six years. Um, and it's been tremendous. When we get to the end of this, I'll, if I have time, I'll explain to you. We, this last year, we adopted a five-year CRR plan in our organization. Our fire commissioners adopted it, endorsed it. Our fire chief adopted it, endorsed it. One of the reasons why I did that, I've seen way too many organizations take community risk reduction, and as the leadership changes, the direction changes. This is able to keep that ship focused in regards to that five years. This is a question that I have. Is community risk reduction just about fire risk? Obviously, it says it wrong. I see folks out there shaking their head. If you're going to talk about risk, you have to know what it means, and they talked about that a little bit this morning. A successful community risk reduction program will push personnel out of their comfort zones. 
And I will tell you, I have taken six years in my organization and I have pushed everybody out of their comfort zones. The interesting thing is, is our CRR specialist came back to me the middle of this year uh, because she was doing a station tours or, or what we call a round table station conversation. Uh, she was going to each station, each shift having conversations with them in regards to CRR. She came back to me and she said one of the biggest things they're saying out in the field is they're waiting to see what the next big CRR thing is going to be. And I looked at her and I thought, well, that's interesting compared to what they said six years ago when I first got here. Because six years ago when I first got here, they thought it would be a fad. Now they're going, huh, I wonder what's going to be the next big topic that we're going to talk about with community risk reduction. This is one of the key points I want to point out. One size does not fit all. What I was doing in South Kitsap at a combination department does not work in Spokane Valley. And one of the reasons is, is because you have, to take, you have to take your data, you have to specifically target your individual groups, and it has to be related to your community and your risk. Now, if your community and your risk have similar demographics or your risk or your problem is the same, you can use the same tools and components in regards to what you were using in other areas. A perfect example is the material generator from Vision 2020. You can utilize those, but you don't want to just take those off the, the, the website and start using them because you don't know if you're addressing your specific hazard. The other thing is, is community risk reduction programs must be willing to challenge the status quo. And in general, it's not just chief officers who reduce risk in the community. When I get through this, it's everybody in the organization, and you will understand that a whole lot better, and I hope you grasp that. How many chief officers do we have in the room? Sweet. Love it. I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone. How many public educators do we have in here? Prevention folks. So they're probably going to kill me for this slide. Prevention activities are half-baked. The reason why I say that is because if you go to a school, you do stop, drop, and roll, or you do... You know, here's your smoke alarm, how to call 911. Those are important features, but it's not really a CRR element because it's not specifically targeting a risk in your community. CRR is targeting a risk in your community, and you need to look at it in regards to, are we targeting a risk in our community? Are we targeting a risk in your first due or your response area? And then what are other risks that we can also look at in our department and even Stephen went over some of those. Most departments aren't doing anything beyond a traditional smoke alarm install or school visits. How many of you guys do smoke alarm installs here? One, two, three, go. Uh, a handful, okay. Love it. The other thing is, is what I want to do is I want to push you outside your comfort zone because CRR needs to be a continual topic and a topic that you discuss or bring up in your department. It should become part of your normal vocabulary, and we'll go through that as we continue to walk through this. Members of our department lack commitment to guide and implement true community risk reduction efforts. Is this true in here? Raise your hand. So I, I saw it when Stephen put his, uh, uh, one of his questions up. Uh, some of it was trustworthy, understanding. What was another one, Stephen? That would fall in line with this. I can't remember all of them right off the top of my head. Staffing, that's another one. Staffing, I love the staffing deal. So here's the thing about it is, is staffing. Fire departments cannot address these risks alone. You have to reach out to your businesses. You have to reach out to your social or service organizations, nonprofits. List, give me some of those. What's, what's some of the partnerships you think you could do? School districts, perfect. What's another one? faith-based organizations. That is awesome. When I was in South Kitsap, we did it with a faith-based organization. They had a group of individuals that would actually go out and assist people that were in their church to fix things that are in their home that need to be fixed. We worked with that group of individuals and taught them about smoke alarms, CO alarms, how to install them. We actually started giving them free smoke alarms to install in their individual homes. So a perfect example. Any other ones? What? HOAs, perfect. HOAs, definitely important. My button's not working here. It's like it died. All right. There we go. Public health. Public health organizations. 
hospitals, urgent cares, CERT organizations, CERT groups, senior services, social services, police, faith-based organizations, neighborhood associations, local businesses, definitely local businesses, community advocates, utilities companies. One of the reasons why I say local businesses is earlier on, we talked about staffing. I think one of the answers was staffing and funding in regards to the lack of. I will tell you right now, we've received $30,000 from State Farm. We received $15,000 first, and they said if all the money's not used, we'll give you a supplement grant with that. Um, literally a week and a half ago, they gave us another $15,000. I have three businesses in our community that give us $5,000 a piece. They also volunteer with our organization. I want you to think about it. The fire service is the most trusted brand in America. Business communities, businesses in your community are looking for volunteer opportunities. Utilize them as resources. They will, uh, they, they will, would love to come and volunteer with the fire department. Here's another piece of the puzzle. I will tell you, the local businesses that we do partner with that give us $5,000 a piece, they come and volunteer with us to do smoke alarm blitzes. We used to do about two or three a year. We actually bought them shirts with our name of our fire department on the back, and it has their business logo on the front. We want them to feel like they are part of our organization. And I will tell you today, if, if, if somebody from those local businesses walked in the door and said they wanted to talk to the fire chief, the fire chief would invite them in almost immediately because we want them to feel like they're part of our organization. We want them to feel like they're doing something to impact the community. Here's another piece. Why do you want CRR? Anybody answer some questions that might not be listed up there? One of the things is, is it was interesting, I heard some folks, actually I heard Chief Waldo yesterday talk about volunteer recruitment. Volunteer recruitment can be huge in CRR. You don't need them on the operational perspective. I can tell you when I was with the combination department, we used to use our volunteers to go out and install smoke alarms, or if we got requests. Um, the other thing that I thought of as I was driving over here, I know Chief Waldo and Bozeman, who's, is anybody in here from Bozeman? No, nope. but I know, I think they're running a bond, aren't they? To fund, it's to fund something, I can't remember what, stations? So here's an important feature, you don't want to be going out into your community the day you put that bond on the ballot. You want to be out on your, you want to be in your community, out in front of your community on a continual basis. So this list just goes through a couple of different items. One of the things I want to point out here, and you'll see this map here in just a minute, and we'll go through it. The other piece is this right here. You can see in 2006 and 2007, or excuse me, 2016, 2017, we had a 369% increase in the number of home safety visits we performed. We also had a 533% increase in the number of smoke alarms we installed. One of those is, is because we started doing some blitzes and we started doing some different stuff, and I'll show you that as we go through. The other thing that I started collecting when I started with Spokane Valley was, what's the value of the structures that we're saving? When we go on a response call, what was the value of that structure and what did we think the value of that structure was when we left? So and we utilize, our investigators utilize a formula for that. But it's interesting, it's very impactful to tell your community that you saved $12 million worth of property. I can tell you the highest number that has been has been $133 million. And I think that was in 2018. I also was able to demonstrate with a marijuana grow operation that we had that we were able to save 257 jobs at an average of $60,000 per job. I was able to show that and say this is what we were able to accomplish. The interesting thing is with the marijuana grow, I got to add into the perspective that that also had a sprinkler system in it. Uh, but I said because of the early warning, early notification, and our quick response, you'll notice as I talk like that, I make sure I use all five E's. I always try to include an emergency response. So 
we have enough to remember. The operational CRR question is what has your station, company, department done to prevent an emergency today? Most of the time we look at this and we say this is our risk to our community. In reality, these are not the major risk to our community because these are probably the most protected in our community. The other thing is, is when you're brainstorming, when you do CRR, you need to do some brainstorming and I'll kind of walk you through this because when we first started our CRR effort in Spokane Valley, it was a station conversation. What do you think we should do? Where do you think we should go? What area do you think we should target? Literally a risk assessment can get down into the weeds that level. And then you go beyond that to look at more of a global picture if you're gonna do a department risk assessment or if you wanna do a station risk assessment. The other thing is make sure you include station personnel, department staff, community organizations, and local agencies. Again, as I said, it's about a partnership and collaboration. It's interesting when I saw this slide and I saw this slide in another presentation and I stole it, it was from Chief Jenkins out of Rogers, Arkansas. And when he talked about community risk reduction, he says, you know, it's interesting that history repeats itself. Healthcare in the 1900s was home-based. Your doctor came to the house. We didn't go somewhere else. The interesting piece is where we're at today in regards to looking at incorporating a mobile integrated health and an opportunity to reduce the, the community's risk. I find it interesting in Anaheim, they are now having a uh, PA right along in a, some of the ambulances. So that way they can alleviate some of the hospital visits. This is our mission at Spokane Valley. So I'm gonna start getting into a couple of the different components that we did at Spokane Valley and all the stuff that we've done, as well as some of the parts and pieces. Again, you have to remember when I first got there, they told me CRR was a fad and it was just gonna be the next thing. So my question to you is, is this CRR? What you're seeing up on the screen, is this CRR? This is where... It's a component, perfect, but it's still part of CRR. The key is, and what we're gonna talk about, is having the conversation in your vocabulary to call this CRR. This is our guys training at a high angle rescue. Next to it is actually a winery. And it was interesting, anytime I see them doing stuff like this or I see them doing other things, I'll always talk to them and I'll talk to them in regards to, you do realize this is community risk reduction because they're preparing for the emergency response. This is another thing, in 2018 we did our strategic plan, one of our strategic plans and our strategic plan came from our entire fire department. There were more guys in operations creating this strategic plan than there were for prevention. The interesting piece is as I read this, I always think back of that first comment when I first got there. The other interesting piece that I'll bring up is, who in here saw the Navy SEAL guy speak yesterday? Knew it. So. What was one of the things he posted, or what was one of the things that he did at the hospital that made the biggest impact? In, say it out loud. His note. His note he posted on the door of his room. That was one individual, one thing. And I want you to think about the impact and the change that that had. He got to meet the president. What was it, two or three presidents have written about it? It went viral. And this is why I say it only takes one person. And the funniest thing is when I heard him say that, I thought that was me when I got to Spokane Valley. And it was interesting because I heard Steven say one person can't do it. One person can't do it, but you do have to have that one person in your organization that's your advocate. And you need the support from the upper administration. That's a big, big piece and a part of it because I was able to maneuver around and do some stuff. The first project we launched started in July of 2016, right after I got there. It's what we call Project Risk. And it was residential inspection, smoke alarms, and knowledge. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to incorporate everything in here. 
in regards to Edith escape plans, smoke alarms, CO. We didn't want it focusing on one particular topic. This is an interesting piece. This is all of our, what I would consider CRR programs or prevention programs. I will tell you half of the programs up here, prevention does not even do. It is done either from our ops, the clutter bag right here. I love when I get to see the word clutter bag. Max Clutter is a uh, rookie firefighter that six years ago when I started. His captain gave him a task or a project, said he wanted him to do a project. His project was is he developed a smoke alarm bag that goes on all of our apparatus. That smoke alarm bag was submitted to me as fire marshal for budget approval. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, yeah, here you go. It was a, a, you know, 150 whatever bucks, sent it out, started doing that. That's one of the other reasons why we try to get our businesses to donate smoke alarms because the guys are installing, the guys and gals are installing smoke alarms as they go out on calls. And it's been interesting to see that. So the interesting piece is, is I want to highlight everything here in red. Everything in black is what was being done before I got there. The interesting piece is, is they brought me there to start CRR. When I look at this, they were already doing CRR. As Stephen and Jim talked about earlier, everybody's doing CRR. They might just not call it CRR. So these are the programs that we added. I will tell you the Starbucks Good Citizen Award. Starbucks gave me their refund cards. We put four of them on every apparatus. If they see somebody in the... Uh, community doing something good or they help them with some kind of response. A lot of times somebody will watch kids while somebody goes to the hospital. It might be the next door neighbor, it might be the friend. What they do is they give them one of those Starbucks cards. Starbucks donated all of that. And I can go back to them and I can get free cards as it continues. And it's funny, I, I, we call it literally Star Bucks, a reward program. Um, the other piece is this VR extinguisher. I'll talk about it here in a minute, but learn not uh, the Stop the Bleed program. That is uh, one that's done by one of our medics. Um, our apartment safety program is done as a group effort. Um, and then our home safety visits, we have our, it's more community based than it is our department based. And then down at the bottom, you'll see we have an SVFD CRR team. That SVFD CRR team includes a member of each uh, union, includes the upper administration, includes the CRR specialist, and includes one person of those businesses that donated to our costs because we want to include them in our effort. And we want them understanding why we're doing what we're doing and why we're doing it where we're doing it and the impact and the difference that they make. Here's where we're going in 2022 and beyond. One of the things that we implemented in 2009 was two squad units, two squad units or two person units that run BLS calls and they run basic life support calls. The interesting piece is that's an operation piece. But I can tell you our deputy chief of ops will tell you it's a community risk reduction because we're reducing the risk of having an engine respond versus a uh, let's just call it a four-door sedan. I can't think of what it is. It's a Ford um, police rig. And I can't... Interceptor, that's what it was. I heard somebody say it. Um, and we're getting ready to implement our third squad. The other addition is, is we're planning on uh, starting an additional station, which is right out here in this area. Uh, Safe Kids with car seats. We're now partnering with Safe Kids, which was Providence Hospital, and they're doing uh, car seats. All we do is open up one of our bays, and they make it a drive through bay, and they do everything else. We do nothing else. And we advertise it on our uh, community social media page. Uh, but I can guarantee you, because people are coming to the station, guess who's getting the most credit for it? It's just, it's a partnership. The other thing that we're getting ready to start is we're getting ready to start a hotel motel program. Um, we're starting to see a lot of older hotel motels in our area that are disconnecting smoke alarms or having issues with tenants. Managers have actually come to us and asked us if we can help provide them with the tools. So we're now trying to provide them with the tools or means necessary. Group homes, we work with group homes all the time. 
We're going to continue to work with group homes, appropriate use of 911, FireWise and Urban Interface. We actually received a FEMA grant for $70,000 to start an urban wildland interface FireWise program. We're going to be doing a community risk assessment on that, and it's also going to go into our maps, and it's also going to be interactive with our community. Looking at the unhoused or homeless, we've, we, we are going to start dealing with that emergency preparedness, addiction, water safety. Water safety is interesting. We're working with Safe Kids again. I think that was it. Yeah, Safe Kids again. And they're putting up a life jacket loaner board right along the Spokane River in our area. Here, this is 2004. This was our worst year for cardiac event, or 2014. This was our worst year for cardiac events. Cardiac events is interesting, and I'll remind you, I didn't start till 2016. This was 2014 when this department was doing this. And they analyzed it, and they looked. This was their survivability rate. They said, we have to do something to change this. And this all came about from a paramedic. So they started CPR classes. The state also started a mandatory CPR class in our high schools. We also started uh, CPR classes in... Uh, the department once a month. The other thing is, is they started looking at the STAT program and they started doing, they, they changed the way we did and they, they started doing what we now call pit crew CPR. Uh, who, who in here has heard of that? Pit crew CPR. So they implemented pit crew CPR. When they implemented pit crew CPR, they changed, we did some internal changes and we did some other changes. One of the internal changes that we did as you, if you look right here, these are all the units that currently respond to a cardiac arrest. And the reason being is because we have to make sure we get enough personnel. You'll see the photo up here at the top. We have to be able to get enough personnel there to make sure that we can make pitch crew CPR effective. The other thing is, is that we started grading each response. We wanted to make sure our compression rate, we wanted to make sure our compressions per minute were falling within a specific category. So they started rating that and they started doing that and they started doing an after action review on an EMS call. So here's some external impacts. These were all the positions that were required. That was one of the reasons why they had to have the number of people through the response. The BC always responded because he had to be the one either being the timekeeper or making sure that he was entering the data into the system. The external impact was is what we didn't realize is our mutual aid partners or our auto aid partners. So we had to start training them. And what you see right here is you actually see uh, this is city fire and this is actually a neighboring fire district. So we started training them in the same. And this was about the year I got there um, that they actually started training and doing that and they realized the impact. They also implemented the Pulse Point app. I'm sure everybody in here has heard of the Pulse Point app? Yep. Awesome. So they implemented that. That's the number of users we have. That's the total number of CPR alerts, as well as other incidents. Uh, we also got nominated to be a verified first responder. How many of you guys have heard of a verified first responder? Yeah, that's where we gave out 52 AEDs as a partner with PulsePoint. We did not pay for the AEDs. Um, we gave out 50 AEDs to first responders throughout our community, and whether they lived in our community or didn't live in our community, they got an AED. If they didn't live in our community, we had to talk to that fire district that they lived in and make sure they got their permission. What happens is, is with verified first responder, if their neighbor has a heart attack, they will receive a notice on Pulse Point and they can go next door and take care of the event. The difference is, is the standard Pulse Point app won't notify you when your neighbor's having an issue because it's a HIPAA issue. So this expands that program a little bit. So we were able to participate in that program. This is interesting. This is a different year, different numbers. You stained bystander, 66%. Does anybody remember what that number was in the first slide? What? Yeah, it was like 9396. 66%. We were the highest in the state. We were really proud of that. We advertised that a lot and got that information out. And this was in 2007. This was 2016. 
So it was interesting. When this came out, I had been there for six months. And I told them, I said, um, I'm not quite sure why you brought me here. You're, 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 doing, see, you're, you're doing community risk reduction. I'm like, this is community risk reduction. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, okay. But when I started having those conversations and started pointing this out, that's when we started having different conversations. This is a young gentleman that was saved with CPR. We noted it, did everything, did the PR piece, everything out there. Um, and actually, it was a pulse point notification. It wasn't a pulse point notification. His coach, he was a football player at high school, and his coach actually started CPR, and actually had somebody go get an AED and brought it back. But we shared this story fully with our community. This is a map I love. So this is a heat map. This heat map is based upon our fire incident data, overlaid with the age of homes. Can anybody figure out why I would do age of homes? Say it. Construction. Why would I, why would I want to look at the age of construction? Exactly. Different products used in the building. Because in 1980s, we required a single smoke alarm. In 1986, we required multiple smoke alarms. In 1993, we required hardwired smoke alarms. So I wanted to overlay that. So we overlaid that with the construction, the years of constructions with homes so we could see what we were doing. As I click the button, you'll see the color code is each year. So this is a color code of all the smoke alarms that we installed in 2016. 2016 is when we entered the clutter bag. So this was only being installed by engine companies or by first responders. 2017, that's how many they install. Again, this was first responders only. Now, the interesting piece is at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, we went and had a conversation with Engine 1. Engine 1 is right here. And we said, hey, where's a area that you think we should go install smoke alarms? You guys know your first due area better than anybody else. What do you think? They said, well, we got an area. Oh, let's go to, two. so it was 2018. That's 2018 smoke alarms installed. This is, you'll notice right here, these purple. That's our first smoke alarm blitz. These two areas right here were decided on by that conversation in regards to the station. That was a, a dinner table conversation. The interesting piece is after we got done with that, we thought, eh, we need to target another area. And I went, hey, see this little hot area right over here? We might want to target that. So we targeted that area. The next thing I said is, you know, we have a lot of high risk mobile homes. You guys have a lot of mobile home parks out here in this community, in your community. I said, we need to target those because I can guarantee you most of those were built in the 70s and 80s and we need to replace their smoke alarms. So we started targeting mobile homes. Wow, this is our administration building. We went to our neighbors first. I didn't need to know they were high risk. I just wanted to go to our neighbors, show them what we could do for them. I wanted to make sure we took care of our neighbors. I mean, what do we do with our own home? The other one is we targeted a senior community out there. I will tell you that senior community took us actually two weekends to do. When we advertised that we were coming there, they actually baked cookies, they had stuff. I mean, they were dragging us from house to house. They were afraid we were gonna miss their house. And you had to spend so much time in their homes. I will tell you, if you have a 55 and older trailer park, go there, do a smoke alarm install, but plan on being there for a while. So this is the last one. We actually went right out here. Furthest point of our jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction is 75 square miles. That trailer park, I'll never forget it. We went in and installed a, oh, well, we actually went in to install a smoke alarm. I knocked on the door. A blind lady answered the door. Her husband came around the corner, and he was hearing impaired. She was blind. He was hearing impaired. I went, oh, my God, are we in the right place? We installed a couple of hearing impaired, a bed shaker. I mean, we got them loaded. And it, 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 I tell people, these are my best days. I love doing that stuff because it's so rewarding. So here's the slide that I like the most. You'll notice this right here. We had four saves in a house. 
What, what, what area is that? That's the area that Station 1 told us to go to. That is literally the first save we had. The best part of this is I can track, because of our installs, I can track who installed it, when it was installed, because it was part of our blitz. I also know that that volunteer team had two members of our fire department and one member of our community with it. And the two members of our fire department were from ops. They were not me. The interesting piece is, when we went and talked to this family, the daughter had a TV that caught on fire in her bedroom. The first thing the father did was close the door to the bedroom. Huh. Heard of that? Close your door before you doze. And that came from our operations people. I was like, are you kidding me? So I said, again, because of what we had because of what our operations division had taught that family, and because we installed smoke alarms, they got early notification, they did the right thing, they closed the door, they got out of the house, and because of that early notification and our quick response, the firefighters were able to contain the room, contain the fire to the room of origin. Did I give prevention one piece of credit for that? Absolutely not. It was 100% all them. But I also talked about emergency response because I had to clue all of that in. This one right here, I'll talk about this one right here. This one right here was three lives saved. The interesting piece was we didn't install the smoke alarms. Well, no, wait a minute. We installed the smoke alarms, but one of their existing smoke alarms started chirping the night before the fire occurred. The second grader in the house had gone through our junior fire marshal program and told his mom that he didn't want to go to bed until she changed the batteries in the smoke alarm. And it happened to be the batteries in the smoke alarm for the alarm that was in the living room. The ones we installed were the ones in the bedroom. They actually got out when the fire occurred. We had that kid and that mom on TV within a, 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 the next day. The other one out here, four, you see right next to our trailer park. It's actually right next to our trailer park. It was not one of the mobile homes that we targeted. It was actually outside the mobile home park. The interesting piece to that story is, is our ladder truck, ladder 10, responded there um, six months prior to this fire. They installed four smoke alarms. One of the reasons why they installed four smoke alarms is because the dad is in a wheelchair. Because of the smoke alarms, those individuals got out. I literally went and visited that ladder company personally and said, I don't know if you realize what you did. But this is what I talk to our folks about in regards to if you go on a call, take your clutter bag inside. If you have an opportunity, install it, install it. Because trust me, you don't want to go back to this call or find out that they had a call there and the guy in the wheelchair passed away. This is the other piece as leaders. You guys raise your hands at Chiefs in here. You get to determine whether CRR is actual service or just lip service in your department. And I say that belongs to everybody that's in your department, everybody that's in that room. Again, I'll refer back to the sign that the Navy SEAL put on the door outside. Uh, it's just our community that suffers when high risk is tolerated. So think about it. Here's another component. This is the most important piece I can have you take away from this is Problem identification plus quality of data collection equals risk reduction strategies. It's an important piece. Your CRR role. What is your vision? Help identify set priorities. What is best for your department? What is best for your community? I can tell you the photos right here are taken from one of our photos. This is our medic that actually does a Stop the Bleed program. He is also on our social media page every, Friday, or every Monday. It's called Medic Monday. He does a video segment that talks to the community about different pieces. We have a documented save from one of our responses of a mother doing the right thing in regards, and I think it was choking. I'm not sure of that to be exact. And she knew it because she had watched Medic Monday on our social media page. 
Again, that's one of our paramedics. That's not, that's not me. Here's another piece. The warm coat program from IAFF. Our IAFF is a big deal about that. They do big fundraisers and they go out to the schools and give out coats. You know what I tell the firefighters? It's a great community risk reduction program. I'm glad you guys thought of it. It's beautiful. Homework. Reducing the risk is your responsibility regardless of your assignment, and it's regardless of your assignment wherever you are in your department. I can tell you when I first got to Spokane Valley Fire Department, I drug in the EMS division chief. I drug in the deputy chief of ops. We all had conversations. They're all part of our CRR team now. The other thing is cultural change requires individual buy-in, and that individual buy-in is the most important piece. I will tell you it does not happen overnight. I would not have been able to walk into the Spokane Valley Fire Department and go, hey, we're going to do community risk reduction, and here's how it's going to go. That would have been like, yeah, right, try me. <laughs> we all know how people are in the stations. It's a gradual thing, but I will tell you one of the biggest things I've done is I've went out to the stations, and I've gotten to know those individuals, and from doing that from day one, I was able to specifically target specifically individuals within our department that I knew that would be willing to support the efforts. Do something. Do anything. Horses that prance don't go anywhere. Here's another piece. Again, as I've talked about, talk about CRR. All audiences use social media. Know the risk. Educate the risk in every opportunity. Prevention is also our job. Learn it, live it, love it. It needs to be everybody included. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about risk and I talk about responses. And it's interesting. I've had the division chief of EMS tell me, I did, he goes, I never thought I would be working for the community risk reduction division. He goes, I feel like I'm doing more work for you than I'm doing for myself. And I just chuckle. Again, talk about CRR with pulse point. Here's our cardiac saves. Again, I talked about that real quick. Here's our investigations. Our investigations building loss value, saves. How much time do I got left? Okay, I got a little more. Uh, but I also talk about accidental, incinerary. Where are we at? How many did we respond? And that's just our investigation unit. I'll actually tell you, for this year, I've been tracking it, we've arrested 13 youth fire setters. Six years I've been there, we haven't done, we've never had a youth fire setter. The beginning of this year, we have arrested 13. The youngest one was 12. I said, mm, something's going on in our community. We need to figure out what's going on in our community. Here's another one, levy dollars. Where does our money go? You know, you heard Stephen talk about it earlier, or I think it was, was Jim. He talked about that competition with the police department. It was Jim when he said he had to go in, or he went into the HOAs, I think it was, and they were talking about, why were these firefighters sitting in the back of the room? And here's what we could do for you and your community. What you got to do is you got to educate them where their dollars are going. And that has to do the same with community or your elected leaders. Here's a piece that we provided in 2019. So we talked about 11 saves. We talked about 80 CO alarms installed, uh, 129 batteries. Again, March of 2019, we went into almost like, no, that was March of 2020. Okay, let's back out of that. But this talks a little bit. It talks about what your levy dollars were, were used for. It talked about a deployment twice with our SWAT team. It, it talked about all of those. Is all of that up there CRR? It is. Here's a, another piece. This is actually the backside. And this shows what we've, how we get to the point that we get for a budget. It talks about some of the programs that we have, what we're doing with that. And this is just information and education that we provide to our community and our elected officials. Talking about CRR, I got a question. Is, is this a photo of the CRR? Yeah or nay? Yeah? Why? 
because I heard cancer, extractors. The other thing is, is this right here, these lockers. Do you allow them to store personal stuff in there? If they're storing personal stuff in there, well, then that's just contaminating everything else that's already been contaminated. Is that, that's CRR. This is uh, eating healthy, CRR. When we decon at the fire scene, that's CRR. Second set of bunker gear, that's CRR. So when I start talking to the upper administration and I start talking to ops and I start teaching them some of that information, they start to get the point. Here's another piece that just came out in fire engineering, is it? Uh, by a gentleman named Todd, and I think he's on the safety and health section of IAFC. And this talks about human risk reduction. But it talks about everything that we just talked about. And it was interesting. I just added this slide this week because the, the article got posted and I thought, this is perfect. So I would encourage you guys to go and look at this. It, it talks about the essential elements of community risk reduction and it talks about it in regards to human risk reduction. Because it talks about the mental response piece. I think jo Chief Waldo went over it yesterday, PTSD. Well, that's kind of community risk reduction. And we're gonna have to involve somebody from the outside of the organization. Understanding your problem. Again, what I talked about, data levels, narrowing it down even to the stations. And it talks about even right here, smoking fires in station three and in station area, seven's area, we have a result of elderly housing projects with lift assist. And in station six, we have overdoses. I want you to notice this is station three, this is station six, and this is station seven. Or station, this is station six, that's station seven. Station six has an overdose problem. Station three has a what? Smoking problem? Yeah, improper. I will tell you station three has a far less smoking problem than we have an EMS problem. Also, I will tell you this is our most influent community within the entire Spokane County area. So we don't have a lot of fires over there. This is our low-income area. We have overdoses. Makes sense. This is our senior population or old folks home. Therefore, we need to target specifically in regards to those areas. What I tell our firefighters is I'm here to provide you the tools that you need in regards to your response. So try to be all hazard. Look at all risk. Again, we looked at lift assist. I was showing you station three, which is about, no, station seven, which is about right here. This right there was one of our senior homes. Our senior homes, we identified that we responded there 1,100 times in one year. 1,100 times. Does anybody guess for what? Lift assist. You know what one of our firefighters found out? He found out they have a policy there that they don't lift people. They call 911. He actually got a copy of that policy. We went to the health department. Guess how many lift assists we respond to today? Maybe 10. I mean, dramatic change. But it was all because of a policy that they had written that was illegal. This is actually our virtual reality extinguisher program. I will tell you, we partnered with them. I ran into them in a rotary meeting. This is a local company, and we were able to develop it. If you want more information, I can share it with you. There's actually a video here. I'm not gonna play that. Embrace social media. I can't tell you enough about embracing social media. Has everybody seen this picture here? Yay, nay? Know about it? So that, that actually is one of the most uh, populated pictures with a firefighter and Mickey Mouse. It's the most used. Use multiple platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Use graphics for people. One of the reasons why I say use multiple platforms is we have learned you will be able to target different audiences with multiple platforms. Here's what we have. Currently in our Facebook, we have close to 10,000. Twitter, we have 5,000. I will tell you on our Twitter page, we have a Twitter page for our fire chief. If our PO, PIO, excuse me, not PO, PIO, 
put something on the chief's Twitter page, we will receive a phone call from the media within 15 minutes, and they will want to do a story on it. That's not our department page. That's the fire chief's Twitter page. It's interesting because they follow them more than they actually follow our own department. Instagram, next door, YouTube. YouTube has Medic Monday. We started doing Fire Science Friday. We have a, a bike program, and there's a video there that I can't get to work. Um, but the interesting thing is, is our YouTube program, all done by people in operations. Prevention has zero to do with that, unless it's Prevention Week or CRR Week. Um, and the funniest thing is he was mentioned in CRR weeks, February of next year, we're actually starting our video series and starting recording our video series for CRR week next week, just to get prepared for it. And I'm like, we just finished fire prevention week. Can I take a breath? Um, and this is one of our firefighters. He does fire science Friday. We call him firefighter or his name is actual, he's firefighter Rick Fryer but we call him science, the science guy, the fire science guy. Um, and, then, and then you got Medic Monday down on the bottom. Encourage, require companies to spend time in their communities they protect. Take advantage of uh, opportunities to interact in your communities. Here's a key piece to this. Everybody in the organization, from ops to prevention to EMS, has to hold everybody accountable for CRR, and it has to become part of your regular vocabulary. If it becomes part of your regular vocabulary, you will start to see others do the same thing. That will make a bigger impact in your organization, and you will start to see over a long period of time that cultural change. Here's a summary. We're all about responses. But we must get serious about uh, reducing our risk before the bell sounds. Again, that goes back to that one saying that I set up at the front. You know, what have you done to keep a call from happening? Get out of your comfort zone. It's not just your responsibility it's, it, uh, as dedicated 40-hour prevention people. It's the mission of the organization. Our focus must be on more than just fire. Think as fires as failures and be recognized as community experts in all hazards. I find it funny that when you talk to most of the community, they'll go to the firefighters to talk to them about smoke alarms or this and that, but where do they go for EMS stuff? Where do they go for some of this other stuff? It's interesting. So with, with that, I'm gonna end. I'll be happy to take questions. I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. The other piece is, as I will tell you, um, Vision 2020 had a couple of resources up. One of the other things that we've done throughout our department, um, we utilize some of those uh, CRR uh, training programs that are online through IFSTA, and every member in our department goes through it. Uh, Recruit Academy, it's in their book. They're required to go through those phases and that piece. I will tell you that's helped change our culture as well. Um, and the other thing is, is I, our community risk reduction specialist always gets about two hours with our recruit academies. The deputy fire marshal gets about two hours and I get about two hours. It's interesting, my two hours, I talk about the most important piece of equipment that a firefighter has on him is that sticker badge. And I tell our new firefighters, I said, I want you to think about when you were a little kid and you were walking through the store and you saw the firefighters. You looked up to them as a hero and if they reached down to you and gave you a sticker badge, you thought that was like best thing since sliced bread. But I also talk to them and I say, hey, if mom or dad are there and somebody else is standing there with you, have a different conversation with them while you're given that individual that sticker badge. And it's funny, I challenge them. I said, if you go to anybody in our prevention office, I guarantee you, you can walk up to them and ask them if they have a sticker. And, they'll and it's, it's funny, uh, nobody in prevention can whip out a sticker faster than me. <laughs> They're not quite sure how I do it yet, but that's one of the pieces of the puzzle that, to me, it can be, CRR can be as little as just a sticker, or it can be as major as having a whole program. So, any questions? None? You? No? Any questions? Again, I would encourage you, think about, change your vocabulary, you don't necessarily have to change your thought process, but start using that 
community risk reduction or risk reduction just as a topic of conversation, you will start to see a change within your entire organization.